Well, good morning. Welcome to the Joint Church's Good Friday service. I'm glad you could be here. We're going to uh, hear from different people today. Helen Morris is going to be giving the word today. But we're also going to be later on taking communion together. So this might be a good opportunity for you to go and get some bread and some wine or some grape juice or some Ribena or fruit juice that's red in colour. And we will share that together with Andy and Sharon McClellan from the Father's house later on. In the meantime, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have today to share in Good Friday, a time when Jesus gave everything for us. And it doesn't depend on our circumstances, but on your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we call out for your mercy and your grace to fall upon our nation at this time, with all that's going on in both our local community and nationally, and indeed across the world. We pray for your mercy and your comfort for those who are bereaved or suffering, for those who are alone at home or in hospital. Father, will you speak into our lives and into their lives? and bring hope to those who might be struggling today. We thank you that we can come into your presence, that you have opened a way and you want us to walk with you. Amen. Here are some words from Matthew's Gospel 27 and reading from verse 28. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe onto him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. And they spat on him. And then they took their staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they'd mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and they led him away to crucify him. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there and above his head they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. At about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came up out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were there guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened they were terrified and exclaimed surely he was 
the Son of God. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 through to the end of Isaiah chapter 53 from the English Standard Version. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and had no beauty that we should desire him. 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul for death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Well, hello, my name's Duncan. I'm one of the pastors at God First at Christ Church, and it's a real privilege uh, to be here uh, really with you today. It's a moment really in history that we gather around Jesus and it's an incredibly powerful statement as churches are gathering together for this Good Friday service. We've done this actually for a number of years now and it's an incredible moment because what is represented today is the unity that is uh, actually being purchased by Jesus. That, that we may do things slightly differently, we may look slightly differently and sound slightly different but at the core uh, is this truth that Jesus died for us so that we could know forgiveness and we could be washed clean uh, and we could receive eternal life. It's a wonderful moment. That's why it's called Good Friday. Uh, and so it's a real privilege uh, in this moment to be able to introduce uh, to you Helen Morris, who's going to be speaking uh, in just a moment. And such a joy, really, to have the Bible opened uh, for us and have Helen speak. Uh, Helen uh, is one of the members of staff, a lecturer over at Moreland's Bible College. Uh, and she in particular heads up the BA program there and so uh, really great to have Helen with us and bringing the word to us and you know just to say really it is such a privilege to have such a, a world-renowned Bible college right on our doorstep full of staff that are uh, amazing in terms of their understanding of the word teaching scripture teaching truth but also practitioners as well uh, seeking to find uh, new ways of doing things to lead things forward but also students coming in and out of that college who've literally gone to the nations of the world so it's good sometimes to stop and give thanks uh, for what God has done uh, and uh, so good uh, to have Moreland's Bible College so close to us uh, and doing such a good work and then to have Helen with us uh, as one of those staff members preaching uh, and teaching is such a joy. Helen is based at Twynham Church, uh, the pastor there Rob Watson who I'm sure you'll have seen on one of these uh, moments this morning, one of these videos uh, and she's very much involved there, rooted into local church. Also someone who cares a lot about the interaction between culture uh, and contemporary church particularly in the UK uh, which is something I think is a, is a real provocation for us how do we keep reaching people for Jesus how does the church keep engaging with its culture so Helen thank you for uh, being willing to be involved in uh, in bringing the word of God to us this morning may you be blessed as you speak may we be blessed as we receive uh, and so I'm going to hand over to you right now thank you so much 
Good morning, my name is Helen and uh, I teach theology at Moreland's College. It's a great privilege to have been asked to preach at this Churches Together in Christchurch Good Friday service. I will be reading a more traditional Good Friday passage later on in this talk, but I want to start a little bit left field by reading some words from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 1 to 4. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Under the cloud, baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, what is Paul, who's the person who wrote this letter, on about? Well, I'm going to leave you in suspense for now, and I'll come back to this passage at the end. Now, originally, this Good Friday service was scheduled to take place in a physical building where we could sing together and then mingle and chat at the end. But as you'll be very aware, we are living in unusual times. And so instead, I'm uh, filming this from my flat. The coronavirus pandemic that we're facing has resulted in great tragedy for people around this nation and the wider world. It's important that we keep praying for our nation and keep praying for those affected. And yet it is part of our resilient human spirit that many have turned to humour to help them cope with the challenges. As a result, there have been a lot of funny videos and memes floating around. My favourite include the Where's Wally coronavirus edition pictures that you can find online. In these pictures, rather than having to kind of pick out Wally in amongst a vast crowd, there are just images of Wally walking alone on a deserted beach or sitting alone in a usually crowded shopping centre. I also really appreciated the brilliant Les Miserables One Day More coronavirus spoof that has been going viral on YouTube recently. Well, William Hazlitt is quoted as saying that human beings are the only creature who laugh and cry. But they're the only creature who is struck by the difference between how things are and how they ought to be. At times like this, when all our lives have changed massively as a result of the coronavirus, we are intently aware of the discrepancy between how things are and how they ought to be. This prompts us to ask two questions. What went wrong? And is there a solution? The Bible answers both these questions. In its opening pages, we're greeted with an amazing picture of creation as God intended it to be. It is a picture of abundance and beauty, of order and harmony. And as the pinnacle of God's creation, humanity is made in God's image, made to be in right relationship with God, each other and wider creation and wider creation. And God describes his creation as good. And he describes humanity as very good. There is shalom, which is the Hebrew word that means peace. And it means not just an absence of conflict and strife, although it does mean this, but it also has a positive sense of wholeness, fulfillment and flourishing. But then things go wrong. We see that humanity rebels against God's perfect rule and the relationship that there is between God and people is dented. God is the source of all that is loving, good, pure and life-giving. And so when humanity turn away from him, what is the result? Well, we see that the result is all the opposite uh, of these things that God is. So we see death, strife, pain and selfishness enter the world. 
as we then read through the pages of the Bible and look around the world today, we can see how much havoc has been brought and continues to be brought by people created in God's image, but who instead of acting with God's character and love, act in ways that are damaging to themselves, damaging to other people, damaging to wider creation and dishonouring to God. So is there a solution? Well, this service is being sent out to you on Good Friday. And at first glance, it seems very odd that this is what this day is called. On Good Friday, Christians remember Christ's crucifixion. So why would a day marking somebody's death be described as good? Well, before I explore this question, I'm going to read a more traditional Good Friday reading. I'll read Luke's account of the events that Good Friday marks. Uh, I'm going to read from Luke 24, verses 32 to 49. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to a place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there held insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for what we are, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn in two Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. I've recently recovered from what I think was a, a mild case of the coronavirus. My chest felt like it was on fire uh, and I was pretty short of breath. I was, of course, very grateful that I was nowhere near as badly affected as those who are being so faithfully cared for by the wonderful doctors and nurses in the NHS. And when we have mild cases of the coronavirus or we have mild cases of other illnesses, there are certain things that we can do to lessen our symptoms. We can take paracetamol, we can drink lots of water, we can mummify ourselves in toilet roll paper. At least I assume this helps or otherwise I'm not quite sure why we all brought quite so much of it. However, although these things can lessen our symptoms, we know they won't heal us. And this is why we are praying and so hopeful that some brilliant biochemists can come up with a vac vaccine or a cure. Well, Christians, Remember Jesus' death on a day they call Good Friday. 
because they believe that through Jesus' crucifixion and through his resurrection to life that we celebrate on Easter Sunday, God doesn't just provide a way to ease the symptoms of a broken world, but he has provided a cure. So why does the death and resurrection of Jesus bring this cure? I'm going to address this question by looking at Jesus' death through three different lenses or from three different angles, as it were. The first lens is the lens of justice. National crises can bring out the best and the worst in people. There have been some inspiring acts of kindness, like those who volunteered to help the NHS, those supporting food banks and buying food for their neighbours. But sadly, we've also seen some terrible examples of human selfishness and greed. I imagine we've been shocked to read of people stealing safety equipment from hospitals, endangering people's lives just so that they can make a profit. I've been deeply saddened to read of the rise in domestic abuse, both in this country and across the world, as the lockdown has for some people meant spending more time in a home in which they're not safe. We are rightly concerned as we read of the plight of refugees and we pray and hope that the coronavirus won't wreak havoc in their camps. As we reflect on these situations, we find ourselves longing for justice. We want those who steal medical supplies to face a penalty for their actions. We want those who abuse those in their household to be punished and stopped for what they've done. We want dictators who are more concerned about gaining control and power than their citizens' well-being to be held to account for what they've done. Well, the good news of the Bible is that God is just. God is not indifferent and apathetic to human evil and its consequences. He doesn't brush sin and evil under the carpet as if it doesn't matter. But rather he is a good God who rules with justice. But God is also merciful and kind and longs to bring forgiveness and healing to the people that he's made. And in Jesus' death on the cross, which we celebrate on Good Friday, we are reminded of the place where God's justice and God's mercy come together, where God's justice and mercy meet. Through dying on the cross, Jesus takes on himself the punishment that we human beings deserve. As fully human, he is our representative. He suffers in our place. As fully God, and therefore our creator, what Jesus does has consequences for all of his creation. The second lens through which I want us to look at Jesus' death is the lens of sacrifice. I imagine you're aware of the story that was in the news a couple of weeks ago about the Italian priest who was suffering from the coronavirus. His parishioners bought him a ventilator, but rather than use it for himself, he gave it to a younger patient near him who was also suffering from the virus and then died shortly after. Such acts of self-sacrifice are very moving. We recognise in these moments that self-giving is the highest form of love. Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate act of self-sacrifice and self-giving. See, perhaps at times we're tempted to imagine that God is aloof and distant, that he's not concerned about the things going on in our lives, that he's deaf to our cares and our pain. But remembering Jesus' death on the cross shows us that these thoughts could not be further from the truth. Rather, God has demonstrated his love so fully in this way that while we were still far away from God, he sent Jesus to die on the cross that we can be reconciled with him. As the prophet Isaiah prophesied many years before Jesus' birth, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him 
and by his wounds we are healed. The final lens through which I want us to look at Jesus' death is the lens of liberation or the lens of freedom. When we look at the world around us and we grieve over the evil that we see taking place in it, well, we also are acutely aware of areas of weakness and brokenness in our own lives. Perhaps in this lockdown you found yourself even more irritable with your spouse and your kids or the other people that live with you. Perhaps without the usual rhythm of life you found yourself succumbing more easily to destructive addictions and temptations. I know that I've been grieved over the selfishness that I see in my own heart. When, if I'm honest, as soon as empty shelves start appearing, so often I find my first concern is for myself and whether I'll be able to get the things that I need. Well, the good news of the Gospel of Jesus is that as we read through the New Testament, we see that in taking on himself the punishment that we deserve for our selfishness and rebellion, Jesus also sets us free from our brokenness. He begins in us an amazing work of transformation. By the gift of his Holy Spirit, he remakes us into the image of God that we were created to be. He helps us to flourish as the people that he created us to be, to become more loving, kind and compassionate. And Jesus doesn't just do this for us as individuals. Rather, the Bible gives us hope that because of what Jesus has done, one day all of creation will be made new. I've just finished teaching some lectures on the book of Revelation to some students from the college. Revelation is the last book in the Bible written by somebody called John. Revelation finishes with a beautiful picture of God's new creation, which John refers to as the new heavens and the new earth. This is a place where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. It's a place where the presence of God is so tangible that John can write, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. You see, the Bible, it, it's a lengthy book. It's a book that's got a number of different human authors. It's a book that covers a, a number of different genres, from the poetry of the Psalms through to the historical account of Israel and what Israel uh, got up to. But as well as being an amalgamation of different types of literature and different books, the Bible is a story with a start and a finish. It works together as a whole. It has what theologians refer to as a meta-narrative. It starts, as I mentioned earlier, with a, a wonderful picture of God as the unopposed king who rules over a beautiful creation that he's made. In the middle, we see the devastating consequences that occur as God's people rebel against his kingship and choose to live their lives their own way apart from God. But then through Jesus' death and the cross and resurrection back to life, we see God's kingdom restored. God's kingdom is restored in part now and will be restored fully when Jesus returns and makes the world anew. So as promised, I, I want to come back now to the verses from 1 Corinthians 10 that I started with. What is Paul talking about? What does he mean by spiritual food and spiritual drink and drinking from the spiritual rock that accompanied them? And what does he mean when he writes, and that rock was Christ? Well, in these verses, Paul is reminding his readers of the Exodus. This was a, the time when God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and then sustained them and cared for them as they walked through the wilderness to get to the land that he promised them. And Paul is drawing a parallel between God's salvation of his people back in Moses' day and God's salvation of those who put their trust in Jesus today. And within this reminder, he makes an important claim about Jesus' identity. You see, back in Deuteronomy, Moses enjoys a kind of play on words between the fact that the Israelites were physically sustained by water that came from a rock, whilst being ultimately carried, guided and cared for by God, who is their rock. In Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 to 4, we read this. 
I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. So by claiming that Jesus is the rock, Paul makes Jesus equal with God. And he also poses a challenging question for each of us today. Who or what is our rock? At times like this, we become quickly aware of how certain things that we thought were secure are actually pretty fragile. We realise how frail our health can be, how quickly a virus strips away our strength and our energy. Perhaps our financial situation seemed totally secure a few weeks ago, but in a matter of days, we've become concerned about how we'll pay our bills. We've been reminded too just how quickly loved ones can be taken from us and how rapidly the, the norms of life that we usually take for granted can just be turned on their head. In this context of challenge and uncertainty, Paul assures us that Jesus is the rock and he is the rock that cannot be moved. He is faithful and the hope that we can have in him is completely secure. Perhaps you already know Jesus as the rock in your life. If so, my prayer for you is that you'd be able to lean on him more fully, trust him more deeply, and express afresh your gratitude to him for all that he's done for you. Perhaps though you don't know that much about Jesus. Perhaps you're still unsure why Christians believe that Jesus' death some 2000 years ago is a source of life and hope. Well, if so, I pray that this Easter you'd have the opportunity to look more deeply into these questions, to find out more about who Jesus is and why it is that Christians have put their trust in him. And I do hope that over time you too would be able to acknowledge Jesus as Saviour, King and Rock.
Hi. We're just about to move into communion time now together uh, as part of this service uh, where we remember uh, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be with you guys. What a strange position we find ourselves in to be homes, in homes, and doing something like this. But nonetheless, no matter where we are, the Spirit of the Lord is in us, it's around us, and it's all over the world. There's nowhere we can be where the Lord cannot be. So in our own homes, this is a good place. So I want to look at today uh, a scripture in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 7. And it says there that moreover they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts of the lintel of the houses uh, and houses in which they eat it. And so that was the sacrifice of the little lamb as the blood was taken and it was actually marked on the doorposts of the lentils of the home and the angel of the Lord knew to pass that home by because they were protected by the blood. There's something powerful in the power of the blood and so today we are similar circumstances. We're locked in our homes. We're being uh, attacked by this plague which is across the whole of the world just not in one country. And so it's a time when this is so important this morning that we dwell on the goodness of God and yeah. that what Jesus sacrificed to make a way possible for us to be reunited with the Father. So this morning we want to look at the scriptures and in uh, I think it's quite important that we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23 uh, where it says, Paul, uh, Paul speaking, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. Now the very first fir the verse after that says that when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the midst of knowing that Judas was at the table who would betray him, in the midst of knowing already that Peter would deny him three times within a few hours, yet the Lord Jesus broke bread with his, with his people. Yeah. Out of a heart of goodness, he shared, even in the midst of people that would betray him. Yes, and yes. so he gave thanks mm -hmm. to his father. He gave thanks for the bread and the wine. Mm -hmm. He gave thanks in the midst mm -hmm. of, I think, a situation that most of us would find very difficult to be in. So there's a key in giving thanks unto the Lord and to say thank you today for what he has done, what he accomplished for us on the cross. And that's why we remember today the goodness of Jesus, that he bore all our sins, that he took it all upon himself on the cross. And then he resurrected again and he brought back the goodness and made a way possible for us to connect with the Father. So as we prepare for communion now, uh, if you've got your Bibles with you and you've got your bread and your wine or your juice, whatever it is you want to use this morning, uh, then just have that ready now. But please don't uh, partake until we say, now let's have the bread, now let's have the wine. So I want to turn uh, to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. And this is the, uh, the, the Lord's Last Supper scriptures. <coughs> So 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So in remembrance, Jesus took the, the, the bread uh, and he actually broke it. After giving thanks for it, he blessed it and then he broke it in that symbol of just brokenness that he was about to walk through. And in this season, uh, just right today, if you have uh, anything that, that is emotionally disturbing you, uh, that you have no peace, that fear has gripped you because of this virus, or you need healing in your physical bodies, uh, you, this is the time uh, when you need to be before the Lord. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, deal with it now, uh, because the Lord is in the midst of this meeting this morning and wants to be you to be completely whole because there's healing in the blood of Jesus. So I want to just ask Sharon just to, to read a declaration prayer just before we take the bread. just want to read Isaiah 53 verse 5 over you. It says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our wickedness, for our sin, our injustice, and our wrongdoing. And the punishment required for our well-being fell upon him. 
and by his stripes and his wounds we are healed. So I'm going to declare this over you right now. If you just want to put your hand on your heart and just take time and just say, Lord, you know, I need healing in my body today. I need to uh, just ask mm. the Lord if there's anyone that you need to forgive right now and just let that forgiveness be released onto them. If there's fear that's coming against you right now, then just let the peace of the Lord just descend upon you right now. So I'm going to declare this over you. Your body, your soul and your spirit will be well in the name of Jesus. You will walk in well-being. He died for you and he died for me. Right here, there are people who need your healing presence, Jesus. And I declare healing into you by the power of Jesus today that you would walk in total well-being. Thank you, Jesus, that you are no respecter of persons. Everyone can come to the table. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here. Let's take the bread together. Thank you. verse 27 in Matthew 26 and when he had taken the cup and given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins mm. and the cup is the representation of the blood of Jesus and the blood the blood cleanses us from everything that has ever hindered us or Come everything on. that's been done against us or everything that we have done. The blood covers that, which means that we stand before the Father clean and worthy tonight or this morning. Um, when the stone was rolled away, he rose in victory and that victory is ours today. That victory is yours today. Amen. Whatever you're struggling through in the midst of this, this plague, you have victory today through the precious blood of Jesus. You get to participate in that because of the new covenant brought in by Christ. You have access to the throne of heaven, direct into the Father's, um, right into the place where the Father dwells, right into the throne of heaven to beseech him on behalf of our nations and our family in this season. We have a saviour who intercedes for us, so you're not alone. Jesus is, is up there and he's interceding for you moment by moment. He's pressing in for you right now. You're worthy of his love. Because of the precious blood of Jesus, you're worthy of his love. That blood will heal you, it has saved you, and it has delivered you. Mm. So let's take time right now. I just would like you to think of maybe your family members and, and just bring them before the Lord. Just as you hold that cup in your hand and, and think about the blood of Jesus, think about your family members right now and maybe just take time to name them just one by one before the Lord. And let's do the same for, for our community in the midst of this virus and the nation. It's his blood that brings us freedom. Mm. Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for your precious blood that has overcome the enemy, that brought victory in our lives today for us and our families, our nation and our communities. Mm. We take time, Lord, to remember you today. So let's partake of the cup. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yeah, Father, we thank you that today there is still power in your blood. Yeah, that the same blood that washed us white as snow is still as powerful today. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice you made for us yeah. at Calvary and the fact that you rose again victorious over death, sickness, sin, everything. There is nothing that you have not laid to, to rest in the kingdom because you have dealt with it all yeah. and you said it is finished Lord so today we give you thanks mm -hmm. as we honor you for being our father for being our savior 
And we just bless you today in the name of the Father, and in the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree His body bowed and drenched in tears They laid Him down in Joseph's tomb The ancient seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all
Well, it just remains for me on behalf of the other church leaders to thank you so much for joining us for this Good Friday service. When we think back a year ago to that last time we were gathered together at the Region Centre, none of us imagined that we would be doing this service this year online. But isn't it good that we've been able to gather even though we're having to find ourselves in isolation? My prayer for you today is that you'll really enjoy your Easter weekend. It's been good to stop this morning, isn't it? To remember that on Good Friday, Jesus died and his life came to an end on that cross. But my prayer for you this weekend is that we journey towards Easter Sunday. You'll continue to celebrate that Jesus didn't stay dead, but he came back to life. But more than that, he's now risen and he's ascended and we can be in relationship with him as our Lord and our Saviour. What good news we have to celebrate this Easter weekend. I pray that you'll be able to celebrate it, that you'll enjoy this weekend in the company of those that you love and the company that those who you can be with. Let me just pray for us as we draw our time towards a close. Lord, thank you. Thank you as we've been able to stop and reflect in all that Helen has shared with us from your word this morning, that yes, you died, that you died, but on Easter Sunday, you came back to life. And in you, we find hope, hope eternal, because as you have conquered death, Lord, you promise that one day we too will conquer death and will spend eternity with you. Lord, we thank you for the amazing promises that Easter brings to us. Lord, I pray for each one of us, the blessing of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit in all that will be about this weekend. Keep us safe, keep our loved ones safe, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>